Holy Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. So begins the children's song, which I expect most of us have heard and sung. Children are drawn to Zacchaeus because they too are small. And it is characteristic of children that they are devoutly desire to grow up. And that is as it should be. However, when for whatever reason, physical stature does not come with maturity, the person with diminutive size will sometimes compensate with driving ambition in an effort to prove that he is, despite all appearances, a big man. I suspect that Zacchaeus was a driven man, and he had been inordinately successful. Jericho was the richest province of the Holy Land, sitting athwart the route to Jerusalem and with access to the lands across the Jordan. It was one of the greatest taxation centers in Palestine. Josephus called it a divine region, the fattest in Palestine. Tax collectors were notorious for their rapacious and ruthlessness. Their business was extortion. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, the head of a cartel of extortion. As such, he was despised by the religious community and by the common people he abused. However, very wealthy people always have their friends and sycophants. And so he was not lonely. Indeed, it is likely that many of his fellow sinners and tax collectors curried his favor. On the other hand, having achieved his ambition, being wealthy beyond measure, able to buy whatever he wanted and to live in the lap of luxury, Zacchaeus was not a happy man. In his heart, he had come to realize that rather than accomplishing his desire to be a big man, his rapaciousness had narrowed his perspective, derived as it was from the abuse of his countrymen. In effect, it had stunted the growth of his soul, cut him off from his righteousness before God, which was his birthright as a Jew. Zacchaeus had traded his birthright for a mess of pottage, and he now knew that he had made a life-destroying choice. But what was he to do? The die had been cast. He was what he was. And barring the miraculous, all he would ever be was an unrighteous, despised man of wealth and luxury. A very little man in all that really mattered. And then he heard about Jesus, the young prophet who many believed was the coming Messiah. Beyond that, he had learned from his circle of friends that one of Jesus' disciples was Matthew, a tax collector, just as he was. Perhaps there was a way of escape from the golden chains that bound him. Perhaps Jesus could rescue him from the choices he had made. Perhaps there was a way, and if there was, he was desperate to find out. And so little Zacchaeus risked the crowd of common folks who hated him and in his desperation climbed a tree just to see this new miracle-working prophet. The rest of the story is one of stunning graciousness on the part of Jesus and in the response of Zacchaeus. Jesus looked up into the tree and saw Zacchaeus in his rich clothing, noted the displeasure of the crowd at this tax collector's presence, glanced into the eyes of this son of Abraham and saw the misery and remorse of a life being wasted in the pursuit of ambition. In characteristic compassion, our Lord called out, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Wow. The request of Jesus showed his acceptance of Zacchaeus and stunned the crowd who murmured in anger and confusion, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now the graciousness of our Lord was met by joy and faith. Jesus makes no request of Zacchaeus. Instead, Zacchaeus, without prompting, gives his all, giving half his wealth to the poor and promising to restore fourfold to any he had cheated would make this very rich man poor. 
Zacchaeus had a long list of those he had defrauded, for fraud was his stock in trade. His restitution was far beyond what the law required, even for robbery. But gladly, Zacchaeus was giving it all. And what did Zacchaeus receive in return for his faith in our Lord? Listen to Jesus. Today, salvation has come to this house since he, Zacchaeus, also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, it is not by accident that the story of Zacchaeus follows close on the heels of the story of another rich man. We call it the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response was that he must keep the commandments of the law. The rich young ruler responds that from his youth he has kept the commandments. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, One thing you still lack. Sell all you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. We know the rest of the story. The rich young ruler went away sorrowfully, for he had great wealth. To which Jesus responds, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to, go through, to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples are appalled and amazed. They say, who then can be saved? And Jesus answers, what is impossible for man is possible with God. Truly I say to you, there is no man who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom who will not receive manifold more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. There you have it. The stories of two rich men, one of whom clung to his riches, the other who gladly gave it all away. Salvation came to one, sorrow to the other. Riches and their hold on us is being used to make a powerful point but it is not that riches themselves are inherently evil. The point is that there is a choice to be made, and the choice is the priority we place on our relationship with God. Do we want salvation enough to make the difficult choice? I am reminded of the agonizing choice that confronted St. Augustine. His problem was not wealth, but lust and his sexual appetites. Augustine, under great conviction, reads the words of Paul in the 13th chapter of Romans. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, not, re not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The choice stark before him. Augustine offered up to the Lord that which had been his consuming passion and became, by the grace of God, one of the most powerful, brilliant, and productive disciples the kingdom has yet produced. Now, I hope that most of us are not enslaved to wealth or to the lust of the flesh or the desire for reputation or the pursuit of leisure activities to the extent the rich young ruler or Augustine were to wealth and lust. Yet I tell you truly, all of us face our moments of truth when whatever it is that we value most, most must be laid on the altar of God. Not that those things may be evil in themselves, but because nothing can be allowed to crowd out our commitment and love of our Heavenly Father. The first commandment is simply, you shall have no other gods before me. I suspect we have all heard many sermons that call us to ultimate commitment. I know that I have. But do we truly understand that to seek first the kingdom of God is not an optional choice, but an absolute requirement? 
What could be clearer than Jesus' repeated command highlighted in all the synoptic gospels? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? God is so very patient with us. Most of us are not so enslaved to whatever it is we value most that everything comes to a head at once. For most of us, we give to the Lord our complete and total allegiance bit by bit. As our understanding deepens, as the shadows of life lengthen, as the reality for our desire for eternal life grows, so we begin to see and understand that we have tried to compromise. We have avoided the radical choice, are not yet abandoned to follow the Christ with our whole hearts. Yet God does not compromise. He will have all of us, or he will not have us at all. I have often said, and everyone needs, that everyone needs not only an initial time of conversion and commitment, but many such. The faith of a 15-year-old is not sufficient for the person of 25. And the faith of a 25-year-old will not suffice for one who is 40. And one who, who is 40 will find that as the years roll on, their faith, their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ must grow stronger, their communion more intimate and personal, their walk more consistent and courageous. That requires, bit by bit, giving it all to Jesus. As Jesus said on the sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now how we do that will be different for us all. Some will be led in their times of private prayer to make the incremental choices that bring their lives into alignment with God's perfect will. Others in the midst of some crisis of health or finances or temptation or even sin will be called to confront their need to give the Lord absolute sway over that part of themselves they know to be lacking. Still others in the fellowship of believers will see in the witness of other saints an example the Lord is calling them to emulate. When and how we surrender to the call of the Lord is a matter of our choice and the leading of the Holy Spirit. I urge us to remember that the Lord is good and his love is everlasting from generation to generation. Yet the Lord calls us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God does that because he loves us and he wants us to be led into deeper commitment and communion, which is a manifestation of his great love for his children. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be given to you as well. They that have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen.